There are many ways you can destroy your reputation, and calling your audience stupid is definitely one of them. Well, insinuating that you hired actresses because they were ugly is another. At this point, I'd try and show you a clip from Henry Cavill, but I thought if replacing him with random women is good enough for The Witcher, then it's good enough for me. Actually, no, they were far too attractive. We're gonna have to challenge the standards with this one. <laughs> But I think one of the worst things about it is when you come out and you call your audience stupid, you may want to make sure you're not looking in a mirror. And maybe make sure that your same ideas haven't already destroyed the show before you say them. With viewership plummeting during the second half of the season, dropping 33% from part one according to Samba TV. So at this point, no matter what your ideas are, they're wrong and the wrong person has been hired for the job. All I'm saying is if Kotaku is coming out and saying that your series is meta, and nobody knows where it's going, then it's not just a wasted opportunity, but rotten to its core. You got any more abuse you want to hurl my way? Because The Witcher has to be one of the easiest setups you could have for a television series. Not only do you have nine books to go off, but you have a game series which is one of the best selling of all time. Ranking ninth on the list of best selling titles in history. People liked the world, they liked your characters, but most of all, they wanted to see the world from the perspective of the person they played in the games. They wanted to see Geralt. So coming out with this result is genuinely impressive that The Witcher C's final two episodes are the lowest rated ever. This is a series that shouldn't be able to fail unless you are intentionally destroying the IP. And yet every time one of the staff gives an interview or the producer starts talking, everybody just starts shooting the IP in the face. Should we call our audience stupid? What about a showrunner who's seemingly obsessed by her lack of dangly bits? There's not a lot of women that have been in my role yet. I want to show a more well-rounded female perspective in a male-dominated genre. Sure, we've heard from a lot of type Bs and I feel that myself. I can find myself in this show. Which is weird, considering it's only about The Witcher. I couldn't find myself in other fantasy shows. I didn't see a person that represented me, and how I walked through the world, and how I saw the world. And so I became a showrunner for a TV series, and just put myself in it, presumably. This is somebody who's so self-obsessed that the fact that she didn't personally get involved in a TV series means that it's such a major disaster for her. Maybe hiring a showrunner who's not capable of abstract thought or understanding concepts isn't the best idea for a fantasy show. Because some interesting things happen when you look at the ratings over time for the show. In season one, the critics weren't so keen, but the audience really liked it. Season two, critics really liked it, but the audience, they're starting to drop off. And in season three, the audience hated it with the reviews dropping down on the critics' front. And Hishrich said, With season three already prepped, I have to say in season one, I don't think we paid enough attention to Siri's story. It's one of my big regrets for watching that season. The season that got the best reviews from audiences. And so we worked really hard in this season, by which she means season two, to make sure that we were on the path to get a lot more Siri. And so, as we left 89% review in season one, we got more Siri and more Siri, and the audience hated it. If you wanted a hit show, you just needed to follow one rule. Make it about the Witcher doing Witcher things. The more they moved away from that, the lower the scores got. And Netflix knew this. That's why they were putting up adverts going, don't worry, he's still Geralt in season three. I mean, he's barely in the series, but he's at least in the credits. If you want to talk about who the stupid people are in this scenario, don't you think it's the people who know the draw of why people are going to see your series in the first place to where you make it your desperation bid marketing? And yet you're so ideologically obsessed that you'll barely put him in your show. Especially when you've got cast members going, ah, I'm not worried about Liam Hemsworth replacing Henry Cavill. The series will be okay, it's fine. Maybe that's why the various cast members are so comfortable just insulting the audience. It was just his half of the dialogue. Now, this interview interview was in Polish, and so we're gonna have to go off the translated version, and you know what translations are like. Sometimes a little meaning's lost along the way, but I think this is pretty self-explanatory. With readers of the books feeling that some aspects of the story have been simplified too much, he said it's painful for us, for me too. He talks about how there are various discussions. One guy whose job it is to make things fit with the books comes up with a long list of things that have changed, and he's like, yeah, but it's okay. There's always a reason for it. Is the reason for it that the wrong people are making this show? I mean, I don't know, if you're adapting something and someone goes, all these things are wrong, and you go, eh, we don't care. Maybe hire somebody that does, because your way is actively setting fire to money. Even in this same article themselves, they explain the difference
differences between the books and the television show, saying things like, well, Vilgefortz was the hero of Sodden, but in the show, it's not him, it's Yennefer who saves the day instead. But it's briefly mentioned in season two that he'll get the title anyway because of politics. And you know what that means. You're pure evil. And you're just another man taking credit. <laughs> for a woman's work. He also says it's Yennefer too who organises the Conclave, whereas in the books, Vilgefortz already knew that this would happen, where they could enact their plan to wipe out the most powerful mages. In the show, this isn't a plan done by him, instead it's just a rather happy coincidence. So you were taking storylines from a bloke, giving it to a character that you would prefer to have at the centre of the show, but then all blaming it on, oh well we just had to simplify things. Uh, this article even ends with, well it's possible, beyond the writer's understandable aim to give Yennefer more to do in the rest of the story. Why would you want to do that? Because that has nothing to do with simplifying the story. That has to do with, I really like this character and I want to see more of them. Because as the showrunner said, she couldn't find herself in other fantasy shows. And so now we can make this show the one I am. She wants to put her own stamp on it. And so that's why she was terrified to adapt Blood of Elves. Because she thought the plot didn't have some sort of forward propelling engine to the plot. Not enough would happen to keep fans engaged. Don't you understand? There are chapters which are just about girls. And so we needed Yennefer, because Yennefer doesn't really appear in the book until the final third. So she thought, could we have a series where Yennefer was just not in the story? I can't do that. I can't do that to her character. So that's our stamp that all of our characters get the same love and attention. So with that then, it doesn't actually seem like it needed to be simplified for Western audiences. It was just that the books didn't focus on the characters that they wanted to focus on. Well, don't you understand? All the characters that we wanted, they just don't get the same love in the books. And so we made them that way. Why would we tell the story like the author intended when we can tell them how we intended for a modern Western audience? You know, the kind of audience who are just sensitive. Because the producer says that the polls see more nuance, especially in the context of what's happening near them geographically. They understand who's good and who's bad, but also how there's a little bit of grey in each person, that a hero who does good deeds can also do some unpleasant ones. But that's not what we get in modern Hollywood. They get rid of morals and principles to begin with and just go, Every Everyone's evil now! While claiming that doing evil is good, these two ideas are not the same. Getting the scrolls to try and wipe out the Earth, and then say that Earth is wrong for defending themselves, that's not morally grey with no good or bad guys. That just means that the showrunners don't understand what good is. But next, he puts it into context in sort of Eastern European wars. I think what he's trying to say is that from a modern perspective, these countries wouldn't be seen as bad guys, but back then they would be. And so some people wouldn't get that. And, yeah, and so you'd probably have accusations of attacking those countries in the modern day, even though you're just going, no, this is just what it was like in the past, mate. Because I'm sure we've all seen that in modern day, where they're trying to claim that somebody who's living now was responsible for something that happened hundreds of years ago. Now, generally the response to these people is that you just laugh in their faces. Instead though, he seems to have taken that as all of America. But it gets really strange when he says that America is always good, the rest are bad guys, and there are no complications. I'm like, have you even existed in the last few years? The majority of the stuff I see now are people complaining that America is bad, and it's always been bad since its very creation. I can only assume you don't go on social media a lot. <laughs> if anything, all I see of sort of modern Californian Hollywood culture is that America has original sin from its very creation. But he goes on to say when a series is made for a huge mass of viewers with different experiences, and a large part of them are American. These simplifications not only make sense, but they're necessary. It's painful for us, although not enough to stop it, but the higher level of nuance and complexity will have a smaller range. It won't reach people. Sometimes you may go too far, but we have to make these decisions and accept them. Are you having a laugh? At the end, he even goes, yeah, we may get it wrong. We may destroy our entire series and burn millions of dollars, but you know, ah, you have to accept them. That's our half of the conversation that's done. But before that, it is a case of of, do you not understand how any of this works? And as you don't, why are you in the industry? <laughs> I agree, when you make anything, you will pitch it at a certain level. You can make content for kids, or you can make it for people who have a PhD in physics. And in any of that content, you'll get a range of people who are slightly above that level and slightly beneath it. But the way he's talking is like, if we just dumb everything down and we make content for people who have 45 IQ, we'll just pull in everybody who's above it. It's like, no, that makes people bored and it makes people laugh at you. And I can't help thinking that this 
last bit is cope. Oh, well, we have to make those decisions and accept them. It's like, is that what you've been told? Because you said it's painful for us and that you have arguments over this stuff. So are you there pushing for the books? Are people coming in and going, no, you can't do this. But someone above you is going, no, you've just got to accept it. Is it that you don't have any power and this is your massive cope? Because you're saying it's painful. Meanwhile, Lauren Hisrich is talking about how she can adapt to these strong female characters. It's just so exciting. It's an honor. This is a full 360 degree view and we don't think about storytelling like that with the men. <laughs> That's just how they exist. The only thing I did was make sure that I was presenting them all equally on the screen. It's called The Witcher. <laughs> you advertise the show using Henry Cavill's reputation, using the reputation of The Witcher. Why are you presenting them all equally on the screen? And by equally, we mean with as little of Henry Cavill as possible. Because in the book, Geralt is obviously the protagonist, The Witcher, and we meet these characters only through his adventures. But the big thing I wanted to shift for the series is I wanted Yennefer to be in it. What was her life, her trauma, her joys, her journey, all before she was with Geralt. The same goes for Ciri. How much of these painful changes, these high levels of nuance and complexity, were you actually making to simplify the story? And how many of them were simply because the showrunner wanted to really shift a big thing for the series and just shove Yennefer and Ciri in it as much as possible? All for those sensitive American audiences. You know, like where Yennefer's involved for absolutely no reason whatsoever, but decides to take a big part of somebody else's lines. Or where you take the words that Geralt says and completely change the meaning of them and as a result weaken it even according to the interviewer. To which he replies, it happens. The decision is made after heated arguments and exchanges of comments. Finally, the showrunner makes the decision so we all stick to that one direction. I can't help wondering that the cope explanation is really confirmed. Help, I've had my bits cut off and I'm desperately trying to preserve my ego by saying we had to do it because they're stupid over there. If something is so important to you that it can cause heat arguments and it only ends when the showrunner overrules you then it's not really a change you agree with or think is for the better. It's just what you're trying to convince everyone else of in an interview and it's even more proof that it's cope when after he's already lost the argument and he's blaming it on just oh it's one of those American problems they're too stupid to understand. Whereas I'm making this video I'm beginning to wonder if he's talking about the production crew of The Witcher and not the audience. It's funny because he's talking about dumbing down the story when the showrunner herself who makes the final call, according to him, says she's a firm believer in challenging audiences. When talking about the fact that Witcher games and books are very popular, so how do you turn them into a TV show while also making it accessible to new audiences, she says she doesn't want to dumb down the story for fans who have never experienced this before. I'm a firm believer in challenging audiences and I think they can keep up. Audiences are incredibly savvy. It's about telling the story in the best way and having faith that people are going to hang in there and be there for it. That is almost the exact opposite of, well, we had to change it because everyone's just too stupid to understand. That's why now I don't even think he's talking about the audiences. I think he's talking about the showrunner. <laughs> I think he's talking about the crew. I think he's talking about the people he had heated arguments with. It's like, look, I kept telling them that this is wrong, that it doesn't go with the books and that their ideas are stupid. And you know what? They were too thick to understand so they couldn't even believe me and the showrunner decided to do something else. Because that explanation is the only thing that makes everything fit together with the showrunners going, no, the audience is really clever and him going but there are some Americans who are just too stupid to understand because if he's talking about the writers I have a feeling I'd agree with him especially when she's talking about the first season when she's talking about how the first series you know it could have just been missions with the Witcher but if she told the story chronologically then Siri would only be in it for the last 10 minutes and audiences would think that that was less important but to her Siri is just as important she realized what she was trying to do here she wanted to tell Siri's story and flesh it out and make sure it feels important in this world. That's what's unexpected about this story. The fact that she changed it all to shove Siri in it where she didn't belong. Because if she put her in where she was meant to be, it'd only take up the last 10 minutes and audiences wouldn't think she was very important. When to the showrunner, she was at the centre of it. Really makes a lot of sense now how that opinion of, I just want to shove all these women into the story, will actually contradict with, I want to stick to the books. They're going to have a lot of heated arguments, except the executive producer doesn't have any power. So when he gets over overruled by the showrunner, 
suddenly he's thinking those stupid Americans can't understand anything. They just can't understand the nuance and, and have to dumb everything down. I'm trying to tell this incredibly complex story and she's just stopping me at every turn. Because when the showrunner makes the final decision, we all have to stick with it and go in one direction. Especially when you've got other comments like Lauren Hissrich herself going, Henry Cavill had to keep coming up to me and asking for more lines because he was barely in the show. <laughs> I don't know, if The Witcher is asking to say more in a show called The Witcher, normally that'd just set off a little red flag in your face, but not if you think this is all about you and I want to see me in the story. I've got to treat everyone equally, which means get back in your box, Henry Cavill, and just piss off over there somewhere. We'll tell you to come on in the last five minutes when we're done with you. Seriously, no wonder he left. Imagine being the only thing that's so positive about your series to the point where Netflix literally put adverts up, and yet knowing that whenever you go into work, you're not treated with any respect at all. Because he loved the books, he got the role that he wanted from the books, and they went, yeah, but we're not going to stick to them. We need to simplify them and bring in all this emotional garbage. It's all reeking a lot like the Marvels, isn't it? Where an actress has even said herself about the complex portrayal of the team. It's gonna be really exciting to see these smart, fun, intelligent, and troubled women. There's three leads and they're all baddies in their own way. No, I don't think it's a problem with the fans. I think it's a problem with Hollywood only hiring people who agree with their own views, which inevitably means you pull in people of about 75 IQ. You know, the kind of people who think they deserve more money when they refuse to work and walk up and down a street for a bit. Whereas if we go onto Forbes, there's more to the interview where he talks about getting rid of cause and effect chains of linear narration otherwise known as life. I don't actually know how you could have a universe that didn't obey cause and effect. It would just be a load of random things happening. But that's kind of what he's arguing for. He says, when it comes to shows, the younger the public is, the logic of the plot is less significant. And when asked what is significant, he goes, just emotion, pure emotion, a bare emotional mix for those people who grew up on TikTok and YouTube and jump from video to video. You may be finding that nobody is really focusing on The Witcher because you've dumbed it down. And if something was actually challenging your audience, like Lauren Hissrich, the showrunner, said was her intention, then they would be able to focus on it. The thing is, at the end, you're talking about attention spans, but that's not what you're talking about here. You're talking about the logic of the plot. A story making sense. You actually said a story doesn't need to make sense, it only needs to be about emotion. That's not an age thing, that's not a generation thing, but it is what you get from the showrunner's interviews. Oh, well, there's not a lot of people without dangly bits in my role. We wanted well-rounded female perspectives. This is something that I feel myself. I can find myself in this show. I couldn't find myself in other fantasy shows. I wasn't represented. How I walked through the world, how I saw the world. None of this is logic, but it is emotion. It is feelings. What was one of your biggest regrets? Well, we needed to feel like we're on the right path with Siri. Why was it important that Yennefer was in stories that she never was? Well, we had to understand what her life had been, her trauma, her joys, her journey, who she was before she met somebody else. It wasn't about logical story progression. It was about her feelings, her trauma. I can't help thinking that when he's talking about, oh, everything needs to be for emotions about the TikTok generation, he's just talking about the crew. He's talking about who he had heated arguments with. You wouldn't have a heated argument unless you thought that what they were doing was wrong. And yet because he's still working with them, he generalized it out to spread responsibility and not get himself in trouble. At least that's what it seems like to me. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Because we actually have information about the writer who will presumably be some of the people he had those heated arguments with. You know, the same writers who were actively mocking the source material, according to someone who used to work with them, actively disliked the books and the games. And he called it a recipe for disaster and bad morale. Now it could be, because as the Witcher showrunner has already said before, she didn't seek out scholars of the books. Because most importantly, the best writers aren't people who are familiar with the work. There are some comments that just when you say them, head office should immediately fire you. I don't know why Hollywood doesn't have people high up in the business who are just like red flag detectors. The moment somebody on the crew says certain phrases, just fire them. Oh, that's a bad sign. Get out, get out, get out. Now she does at least say, you have to be familiar with the original work. Notice she doesn't say respect it or like it. No, just be familiar with it. I know The Witcher exists as a piece of work. Now the writers and staff have read all of the books and had to appreciate or enjoy the genre, not the books, the genre. So you could despise The Witcher books, but as long as you like Twilight, that would count. In 
instead, she just found some people who knew about the books. Those would be the people who were having heated arguments. But it was equally important to have writers in the room who were able to question them. In its simplest form, we need people who would fight for the spirit of the books, but also writers who know that you can just change them. People who are willing to step back and open their minds in order to bring their beloved world to our one. I hope we did that. She wanted people on a spectrum. I think she managed that one. She wanted talented writers, as defined by her, including people who were brand new. People she could mentor and train to be just like her. So, and so, if we're hiring brand new writers with no experience who don't even have to like the books, how are we hiring them? Well, we're hiring because of how they identify, basically. So, when you're hiring new, young writers who don't like the books, and someone who likes the books is talking about arguing with them, but saying the showrunner makes the final decision and so I've got to go with it anyway, I think it's a bit more evidence that uh, he's talking about them rather than the general audience. And the thing is, when your viewership is dropping, not putting out another season until at least 2025, when you're replacing the actor who's the only reason anyone was watching that show in the first place, the reasons why it should probably just go away forever quite stack up quite quickly. That it barely held the number one spot in Netflix's top 10. It resurfaced to number one when its final episodes were released, but it got replaced at number one by a show that isn't even new. It's an old show that overtook it, which which means you got the sudden surge of people that were really interested to see what this was like, and then nobody else cared, or they heard the reviews and just decided not to bother. It's not a typical fantasy book, it's not just one world, it's not just one story, it's a huge world, very, very complex. It's a multiverse! Oh, why did you even need to employ Liam Hemsworth if you're gonna do a multiverse, just get Mickey Mouse out and make it animated? Just animate one of the Beast Wars characters and bring him in. It'll have as much to do with the books as the rest of the show does. As long as Lauren Hitchrich feels that it's correct, then I'm sure we'll be on to a winner. Which is probably why they deliberately hired people who didn't even need to like them. You got the casting director coming out and saying she just used the TV series as a platform in order to manipulate the viewer's unconscious bias. That casting can have a real, profound impact impact on the people watching it. Because it's subversive, you see. You can change things in a tiny way because you're in people's homes and they're watching this world. And she can use it to convince people of her own little delusions of things like how hard it was to be her. She made up an entire false life in her head about what her child was going to have to go through. And her own delusions made her sad. I can't protect her from this strange little universe I've made up in my own face. When she says she hired her because she was uh, challenged beauty standards. And if you think that challenging beauty standards and ugly don't mean the same thing, then try telling someone that they're so brave to leave the house challenging beauty standards as they are. I don't think they'd be very pleased with you. In the book, she's described as the most beautiful woman in the world. Oh, we've got one of them in the Wheel of Time as well. You wouldn't know. This was a few years ago, and I'd like to think things have changed. She'd like to think that no one would describe her as the most beautiful woman in the world anymore. It's in these fantasy worlds where people are predominantly European, because it was written by a Polish author and set in a world like Poland that he knew about, which is very common for authors to do. Why didn't this Polish author create a work of fiction that was set in California? I can't understand. Yet again, somebody who can't handle abstract concepts or anything out of their own experience. If it's not inside my own face, I can't imagine it possibly existing. You must be a bigot. And that's the actual article that it came from with a headline that should be enough to make anyone go dizzy and need to steady themselves on the couch. The power of casting to change people's perceptions. You strange little lunatics. What a creepy crew you've hired over there at The Witcher. At this point, I've gone from, it's a shame that Henry Cavill left The Witcher, to, that guy had a lucky escape. I don't know how he stuck you for three seasons. And so, as I said at the start, when this was the easiest setup of all time to make a show, with the third game ranking ninth in the best-selling game titles of all time, it would have taken a concerted effort from multiple people within the production, but most of all, from the people at the top, to absolutely destroy it in the way they have. With the audiences dramatically lowering their opinion of every season that came out. You went from 89% to 22% in two seasons. All because, as the showrunner said, she didn't want to focus the book storylines because she wanted other characters to come in and take priority. All anybody wanted was the Witcher doing Witcher things. We wanted Geralt to go around and do Witcher stuff and everyone else is a side character who is irrelevant. But not in Lauren's opinion. She had to get all these other strong women that represented her 
into the limelight so that they could represent her and all her strong friends that could go out and use this as a platform to change the way people thought because they were in their home. The Witcher wasn't destroyed accidentally by incompetence, they simply made it the show they always wanted. Then everybody saw what it was and fled. And now you're left with no main actor that you think's just fine because you've got the ones that you wanted all along. You're gonna replace him with a new guy and walk into a production of heated arguments because you've got people that want to reflect the books and people who just want to rewrite it to turn it into their little mouthpiece to change opinions, to challenge beauty standards. What can I say? You're on strike right now asking for more money. The only thing I want is to see your viewer numbers. I'm all for transparency and show viewer numbers so that you can get paid what you deserve. Because after the mess that you've turned The Witcher into, you want to know what will be really funny. You want to know what will be really entertaining. To see how much of your audience you've scared away through your own insecurities, your own self-obsession that you've got to see yourself in every piece of work because you can't even understand abstract concepts or think of anyone but yourself. You would assume that somebody who's that lacking as a person would at least have the intelligence to keep it to themselves. But not in Hollywood where they've praised ego so much they have no idea what's even wrong with that statement. But those are just my thoughts, what are yours? Let me know down in the comments below, like the video if you liked the video, subscribe for more videos like this in the future and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye